I call it kind of an elephant in the room, hiding in plain sight that nobody seems to have noticed. All the major climate models are missing one key variable, says John Clauser, winner of the 2022 Nobel Prize in Physics. He was one of the two Nobel laureates to sign a declaration by a global coalition of scientists stating, there is no climate emergency. This is clearly the most important mechanism that controls the climate, controls the temperature of the Earth, and stabilizes it very powerfully and very dramatically. In this episode, Clauser breaks down how clouds and variations in cloud cover profoundly impact the climate. This is American Thought Leaders, and I'm Yanya Kellick. Dr. John Klosser, such a pleasure to have you on American Thought Leaders. Okay, thank you. Well, Dr. Klosser, first of all, uh, congratulations on winning the 2022 uh, Nobel Prize for Physics um, in this realm, which I've always been absolutely fascinated with, quantum entanglement, you know, spooky action as a distance, as, it's, as it has been called. Um, but you have actually been in the news late recently over another issue, which is climate change. And, and, I'm, and I'm just very, very curious, before we d dive into this, um, how is it that you uh, became involved in this? How is it that you got interested in this? Well, I, I have been uh, interested in climate science for most most of its uh, most of its history, including back to Al Gore's original uh, movie and, and the like, uh, and I have been rather distressed about the poor quality of the science that is being done. Uh, and in fact, uh, back around in 2010, I, there were any number of uh, uh, requests for comments by the American Physical Society, which I responded to, and all of which were. Uh, totally ignored. Um, but And then when I was in Stockholm and talking to the uh, prize committee uh, who awarded this uh, my prize in, in, in physics, I pointed out to them uh, that I disagreed with their 2021 uh, Nobel Prize that they had given, that I believe that the, uh, the dominant process in controlling the climate has been totally misidentified. They identify it as due to carbon dioxide. I identify it uh, totally differently. And if you go back through and read all of the various uh, IPCC reports, the National Academy reports, the Royal Society reports, they all are totally clueless. Uh, and frequently even admit to being totally clueless as to the effects of clouds. Actually, one of the things that got me interested in studying this was I'm a sailboat racer. I raced across the Pacific Ocean at least a dozen times. And I remember lying in, I had set up the boat, my boat with uh, solar uh, panels to charge the batteries. And we were sailing along, I was lying in my berth, and I had an ammeter uh, on the uh, power output from the solar panels. And I noticed every time we sailed under a cloud, the output from the solar panels uh, dropped to by 50% to half of its value that it was. And then we came out from behind the cloud and boom, the power went back up. And I thought, gee, I wonder why it's just about a factor of two. Uh, and then I spent a fair amount of time staring at clouds, how they move, how they watch, just from uh, uh, sailing across <laughs> the Pacific Ocean many times. One needs to study these things. And uh, so I became uh, very curious as to how clouds work. Um, and then when the, the climate uh, issues uh, came uh, along, I very quickly realized that cloud cover has a profound effect on the, the Earth's uh, heat in input, that the clouds are reflecting a massive amount of light back out into space. And so I then read all of the various IPCC reports, uh, National Academy reports on this. As a physicist, 
Uh, I used and worked at uh, some excellent institutions, uh, Caltech, Columbia, Cal Berkeley, where very careful science needed to be done. And reading these reports, I was appalled at how sloppy the work was. And in particular, it was very obvious, uh, even in the early rep earliest reports and all clear on through to the present, that clouds were not at all understood and were very poorly treated as just simply bad science. Well, absolutely fascinating. And so, you know, well, well one quick question, okay? So I'm sure someone has said yeah. this to you, okay? Um, you know, you're, of course, uh, an expert in quantum mechanics. Has anyone said to you, hey, stay in your lane. Climate change isn't your thing. Instead, what I was told when I was doing the quantum mechanics uh, experiments was, oh, everybody knows the results of the experiment. Uh, it's unimportant. Uh, you're wasting your time. The experiments that I did that won the Nobel Prize, I was told uh, very specifically, what a waste of time and effort. Uh, uh, you're spending, wasting money that could be otherwise spent doing some real physics. That is, that is absolutely astounding. Well, why don't, before we jump into the climate change stuff, why don't you just quickly explain to me, you know, what, what you what your experiment found? That was work that I did over 50 years ago when I was uh, actually still in graduate, started when I was still a graduate student at Columbia, and then where I read a fascinating paper by John Bell and realized that this was a way of settling a years old argument between uh, Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein. Actually, Albert Einstein, uh, along with Schrodinger, uh, Erwin Schrodinger on one hand, and Niels Bohr along with John von Neumann on the other. And I realized that, number one, that they had never resolved the, the, the details of, of their discussion. Uh, and number two, that I could actually design and an experiment uh, to uh, test and see which side of the argument uh, was right. So I did exactly that. It showed that it's a very real process and that particle, in particular, that particles can be remain entangled in quantum mechanically entangled no matter how far apart they are, are separated. Uh, in my experiment, we had a pair of particles separated maybe 20 feet apart and they were still in, uh, entangled. Now experiments have been done where they're a thousand kilometers apart and still remain in, uh, entangled. And everybody told me at the time, uh, well, you got the results that everybody expected. We all knew that Bohr was right and the Einstein was wrong. Uh, and it, it, it sort of got filed away and, and took uh, 50 years to be recognized as about uh, as actually a rather important uh, feature of physics that uh, quantum entanglement was not only misunderstood up till then uh, but was actually uh, very useful once it became useful that really kind of uh, got uh, people's attention that was money coming in from CIA NSA uh, who realized that it could be used for uh, for encryption, uh, encrypted communication. So once money uh, became part of the deal, uh, all everybody took notice. You know, and I just want to comment on this. You know, when I first learned about this many, many years ago, you know, of course it captured my and you know millions of people's imagination that you have you know one particle on one side, you know, thousands of kilometers or millions of miles apart, and it changes its polarity and the other one instantaneously changes as well. Well, that's uh, the tricky bit. You, you, you don't know. The question, there are two questions. One is whether or not it has these properties to start with. So if you want to change the property of one of the particles, you need to claim that it indeed has the pro said properties. Effectively, what uh, quantum mechanics says is it does not have these properties before you measure them. And what Bohr was arguing was, don't ask. 
why it doesn't. It just doesn't just accept it. I, I found that uh, very disturbing and, and uh, distressing to, uh, uh, to, to, to believe. I didn't understand it. And Einstein similarly uh, didn't buy uh, uh, Bohr's arguments. Well, but in the end, I think you, Bohr was vindicated, right? Through your experiments, if I understand that correctly. Uh, well, Einstein was clearly wrong. Uh, Einstein's whole program it appears to be in shambles, including some of the fundamental pillars of, behind uh, general relativity. But I don't know that uh, Bohr's saying, don't ask, don't tell, uh, is uh, particularly satisfying either. Well, so perhaps a topic for another show. And so let's, so let's dive into the yeah. climate change uh, stuff here, which I find absolutely fascinating. Why don't you give me your case for how is it that clouds, which are obviously, you know, very, very important part of our, of our system, um, have somehow been overlooked in these models? Um, okay, it's an interesting history behind that. That goes back uh, clear to the, the original National Academy report in 2003, and then percolated through all of the various IPCC reports. But I think one of the more important things that's happened recently uh, is a gentleman, Steve Coonan, who was Barack Obama's uh, science advisor, recently published a very important seminal book called Unsettled, What Climate Science Tells Us, What It Doesn't, and Why It Matters. It's a very important book. And his basic message is that the, the IPCC has 40 different computer models, all of which are making predictions, and all of which are being quoted by the press as predicting a, a climate crisis apocalypse. The problem is they all are in total disagreement, violent disagreement with each other in their predictions, and not one of them is capable of predicting uh, retroactively, of predict, uh, explaining the history of the Earth's uh, climate for the last hundred years. He finds this very distressing, and he then uh, correspondingly uh, says, or believes that there is some important, uh, there's an important piece of physics uh, that is uh, missing in virtually all of these computer models. And so what I'm adding to the mix here is I believe I have the missing piece of the puzzle, if you will, that has been left out in virtually all of these computer programs, and that is the effect of clouds. The 2003 National Academy report uh, totally uh, admitted that they didn't understand it and they made a whole series of mistake, uh, mistaken statements uh, regarding the effects of clouds. If you look at Al Gore's movie, he insists on talking about a cloud-free earth. And the only way he can do this, he generates one for the mosaic of photos, each one taken on a cloudless day for covering the whole earth. That's a totally artificial earth and is a, a totally artificial case for using a model. And this is pretty much what the IPCC uh, and, and others use is a, a cloud-free earth. If you look at pictures uh, of the earth in visible light, i.e. real sunlight, which is sunlight is the stuff that heats the earth. Uh, the Infrared re-radiation is the stuff that, that cools the Earth. And it's the balance between these two that controls uh, the Earth's temperature. And the important piece of the puzzle that has been left out is trying to do this all with a cloud-free Earth when the real Earth is shrouded in clouds. I have some pictures, I don't know if you can uh, show them, of satellite pictures of the Earth. These are all freely available on NASA's website. And they show cloud cover variations anywhere from 5 to 
Typically, the Earth is shrouded in clouds uh, at least between a third of its uh, area to two thirds of its area, and this and this it fluctuates. The cloud cover fraction fluctuates uh, quite dramatically on daily, weekly time scales. We call this weather. <laughs> you can't have weather without having clouds, and it is this fluctuation in cloud cover of the earth that causes what I would refer to as sunlight reflectivity thermostat that controls the climate, controls the temperature of the earth, and stabilizes it uh, very uh, powerfully and very dramatically. Uh, of this mechanism, totally uh, heretofore unnoticed, uh, and I call it kind of a, an elephant in the room hiding in plain sight that nobody seems to have noticed. Uh, I can't imagine why, why not, but there were similar elephants in the room in quantum mechanics that I discovered. So the variation in the cloud cover, uh, the, the importance in the actual power balance is 200 times more powerful than the uh, effect, uh, the small effect by comparison of CO2. And I might add also of methane. They're all, methane and CO2 are comparable in the, uh, in the total heat loss. So I, let me give you an example of, uh, of how, how this mechanism works. Okay, first off, you have to notice that the earth is two thirds ocean. And that's where most of the cloud, the importance of the clouds comes in. Sunlight is the heating mechanism. Clouds appear bright white. Ground, oceans, etc., are very dark and reflect very little light. But clouds reflect 90% of the sunlight that hits them gets reflected back out into space, where it no longer comes to the earth, no longer heats the earth. Say you only got a, a third of uh, cloud cover. So you now have lots and lots of sunlight. Sunlight impinging on the ocean evaporates seawater. Seawater forms water vapor. The water vapor floats up to the, up into the sky and forms clouds. It forms lots and lots of clouds because the cloud uh, creation rate is very high. But we started out with too low a set of clouds. And now we have an increasing number. So now we end up with very high cloud coverage. Okay, so now to say it's two thirds. Well, let me give you an example. If you want to try to read a book on an overcast day, indoors, without turning the lights on, it's just too dark. You can't do it without turning the lights on. The question is, where did all that sunlight go? It's coming in scattered light coming in through the window, but boy, it's a lot darker now. So uh, where did it go? There's only one place. It got scattered back out into space where it's no longer uh, heating the earth. So, okay, so we now have the total of power input coming to the earth is now much, much smaller. Okay, well, this is happening on the oceans too. If you have large cloud cover, you have a lot of shadows. Clouds create shadows. You can see this by standing in a, a watching clouds pass over. Well, the oceans are now shadowed. The shadows don't have enough energy to evaporate anywhere near as much water. So if we have too much cloud cover, then the, oh, we reduce the evaporation rate of water and so that then re reduces the production of cloud. So we now have these two competing clouds. Okay, so the, the power loss is like 104 watts per square meter when we only have a third cloud cover and 208 watts per square meter of surface area of the earth when we have a very low cloud cover. So the difference between those is the order of 104 watts per square meter of surface area. That needs to be compared with this minuscule half a watt per square meter of surface area air that CO2 contributes. So the power in this thermostat, in terms of what they refer to as radiative forcing, 
So these are the how many watts per square meter of surface area uh, are, are involved. It is 200 times more powerful than the effect of CO2 and also methane, by the way. So I then uh, assert that this is so powerful. I mean, it's like you have a, your house has a huge furnace with a very uh, accurate thermostat controlling the, uh, uh, its temperature and somebody leaves a minor, a uh, small bathroom window and there's a small heat leak. Uh, would you, the rest of the house, notice a, ch a change in temperature? None of your thermostat is working very well. This is clearly the most important, the controlling uh, mechanism for the Earth's temperature and, and climate, and it dwarfs the effect of CO2 and methane. All the government programs that are designed to uh, limit CO2 and methane should be immediately uh, dropped. We're spending trillions of dollars on this and it's sort of like Everett Dirksen's famous line, you know, a trillion here, a trillion there, uh, and pretty soon you're, you're talking real money. Dr. Klauser, let me jump in here for a moment. Are you saying, sure. and it's, it's kind of common sense that cloud cover would play a role in these IPCC climate models, but are you suggesting that in none of these models, uh, the cloud cover is actually included? In, indeed. And in fact, uh, Kunin mentions this uh, in, in, his, uh, in his book. They really didn't mention anything uh, in the uh, early IPCC reports. Uh, they, and finally, like in 2013, in the so-called AR5 report, they finally got a big section on clouds. And none of these uh, uh, properties that I have just mentioned, the fact that, that we have this huge fluctuation in cloud cover, the fact that the cloud reflectivity uh, is varying by this huge amount of power loss out into space. None of that is, is mentioned. They all, all these models, and they've gone to great effort in saying, uh, saying well, the Earth's albedo, okay, that's the re average reflectivity of sunlight, if you will, the re reflectivity uh, fraction of sunlight, uh, they all say, well, what is it? And it's 0.3 and it's, and, and Kunin mentions, gee, you know, if we somehow it got uh, raised to 0.31, uh, that would uh, buy, and that would only take a 5% increase in average uh, cloud cover, uh, that would uh, totally wipe out uh, any the effects of, of say, doubling uh, CO2. Uh, <laughs> nobody this, seems to notice that there's this huge variation from like 5% to 95% uh, cloud cover quite visible. Uh, and it's, uh, I have no idea how could they, they, they can have missed that. What I'm hearing strains all credulity here, all semblance of credulity. So the, there's one fa there's one factor of this of the albedo, which is this you know reflectivity measure, and and it's just basically kept the same throughout all these different models, even though the reality is so dramatically different. Obviously, it is kept the same, and in fact, uh, there have been even worse. Uh, there have been any number of proposals, totally silly ideas. Uh, like painting all the roofs of the world white, uh, all the highways white, uh, and you can't see any roofs or <laughs> from the satellite pictures. The, the total area of roofs is vanishingly small, and there's no way it's going to affect the uh, uh, power balance. Uh, uh, and some of these model, these proposals are all geoengineering proposals. Uh, solar radiation management proposals um, are, are totally silly and outrageously expensive. We're talking for the for one of the proposals, uh, talking about a trillion dollars a year to spend on solar radiation management. 
what I am asserting here is that the Earth provides its own, own solar radiation management. It's built in, uh, it occurs naturally, it works, it's very effective, and it's free. And you don't need to spend trillions of dollars per year. Do you have any idea how something maybe so obvious, how there could be an oversight of this nature around something, a variable that's obviously incredibly important in this equation? Well, uh, I ran into uh, two other, what I refer to as elephants in the room in, when I was studying quantum mechanics. So virtually all of the, the quantum mechanics uh, experts and physicists in the world seem to have ignored, ignored some very simple uh, and obvious when you see them and think about them, but not obvious if you haven't. Like for example, this, uh, a, I discovered a point by, made by Max Born about how the, the difference between uh, the two Schrodinger equations, uh, that they're working in very totally different spaces. And when Bohr was talking to Einstein, each one was assuming the other was working in a different uh, space. One was working in configuration space, one was working in laboratory space. And for some reason, these two very bright guys didn't seem to notice that they were arguing in uh, uh, past each other and then talking about uh, uh, formulations of, of the wave function in uh, these two totally different uh, spaces. And this went on for 80 years until I po pointed out in a, in, a, in a recent paper. So yes, uh, things like this uh, do occur. So is the, are the IPCC modelers rushing to incorporate these changing variables of, our, uh, of albedo according to actual, you know, real measurements, for example? Not, uh, not to my knowledge, not yet. I haven't, I haven't talked to any, any of the modelers, no. And no one has yet got, contacted me. In fact, this is the first... Uh, um, my, my comments to you and uh, more recently and others are kind of the first revelation of all this. Oh, I mean, it, 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 it's absolutely fascinating. And, you know, <laughs> I guess of profound significance because this question of trying to mitigate anthropogenic climate change is a kind of a become a dominant, you know, kind of f force in politics and in, in basically how how country, entire countries are organizing themselves. I agree. The whole world is doing all of this. Uh, a lot of the pressure is actually coming uh, uh, from Europe, all of these various world conferences. Uh, all of this is coming, I, I'm guessing, from started out by, uh, 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 initialized by Al Gore's movie. And Al Gore's movie has a lot of... Uh, uh, of uh, incorrect science built into it.